Good evening, everyone. We're now in Jeremiah chapter 14. This chapter describes God speaking to Jeremiah and giving a prophecy, and Jeremiah interacts with God. And so we need to bear in mind that this is really now very much an interaction uh, going back and forth between God and Jeremiah, and Jeremiah pleading on behalf of Israel, or in particular now, Judah. In verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the droughts. Now understand that this is a period which we don't know exactly when, but by elimination, we think that this would be at the period of Zedekiah. But the word drought is something that we need to understand, uh, just like famine. The idea of famine is about hunger. Now, the idea of drought is about collecting water. And that is how the Hebrew words work. So it is translated as drought, and it's correct. And it's coming from an imagery of looking for water, collecting water, because it, it, it is very scarce. And so this is recording according to the drought that God is bringing. And so the prophecy begins in verse 2. And from verse 2, it speaks about Judah. And so the target audience is Judah, the southern kingdom. And he says the southern kingdom mourns. The idea of mourn here is to lament. Water is an extremely important resource. And so it says, and Judah mourns. And then it says, and her gates languished. Now the idea of languished here uh, literally is, well, I guess you can say it, it's about weakness. The her, her gates are cut off. I think that would be a better way of looking at it. Right? Her gates are cut off. And I'm sure that we begin to see how the nation, the southern kingdom itself, is facing challenges from an oncoming enemy. Then it says here, uh, they mourn for the land. Now, unfortunately, this is not how it should be read. It's not about mourning for the land. It says the land actually has become dark, right? The word mourning shouldn't be used in this case, for the land has become darkened. And the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. And so you, you get a picture here that Times are going to be very bad. And the cry of Jerusalem means the cry of the people. Judah means the people in Judah. So in verse 2, we are given a picture that things are going to be so bad that they are going to mourn. And it's not only because of drought, but drought is a picture where they will have no water and people are dying. Verse 3. Their mighty ones have sent their lads for water, looking for water. They went to the cisterns and they found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. Their container is empty. They were embarrassed and they were ashamed and covered their heads. 
let me just express these words a little clearer. In verse 3, the first idea here is about putting to shame. Disappointed. Right? They are embarrassed. The second word here is about humiliated. And so you can think of it as uh, ashamed. Or you can think of it as being humiliated. Why? Because they were sent out to look for water and they found no water. They came back with empty hands, meaning they came back with in vain. And then they covered their heads. And this is a symbol of shame. They have no, well, you can call it in our modern day terms, uh, no faith to see those who have sent them off. The mighty ones have sent young lads out to look for water and there is nothing. Now, the first few verses here describes the condition. He says, but the ground, because the ground is parched. The idea of parched uh, should think of it as broken, right? It's broken. So you can think of it as so dry that the ground is breaking apart. For there is no rain in the land. The farmers, they were ashamed. They covered their heads. We're getting that picture. Really no water. Yes, the deer also gave birth in the field. But she left because there was no grass. Now understand this. It's not very clear here in verse 5 in the translation. The idea of leaving is that she abandoned the young. Because there was no grass to eat. And the wild donkeys stood in the desolate heights. They sniffed in the wind like jackals. Uh, because they are looking for things to eat, their eyes failed, for there was no grass. Now, this word grass is herbage. I think that would be a better uh, explanation. Herbage. No grass, no bushes, no shrubs. And so, basically, the animals here is described as nothing to eat. Now, we draw a line here because that is where God is describing the punishment to Judah. Now we come to verse 7. Verse 7 begins a discourse by Jeremiah, very similar to the time of Moses, right? Uh, and, and even Daniel, where he they prayed and, and they stood before God and appealed on behalf of the people. And so Jeremiah is doing it right now. He says, Oh Lord, if our iniquity, so I think this would be a good way of using the word if. If our iniquity testify against us, O Lord, then do so for your name's sake. Now, this is important because this, uh, 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 this appeal, actually, is very similar to how Moses has tried to appeal. Israel is actually a testimony of God. So think of it this way. God brought them out of Egypt, 
across the Red Sea, across the wilderness, into the promised land, and, and they are about to be wiped out. And God is saying this is because of their iniquity. But hold, hold the judgment. Do it for your name's sake. For our backslidings are many, and we have sinned against you. This is basically um, Jeremiah standing in front of God and on behalf of the people to appeal to God not to launch such a vicious judgment for your name's sake. For your name's sake, because this is about God, that people will say that, you know, you brought the people out only to destroy them. However, he continues to say, oh, the hope of Israel, his savior in time of trouble. This idea of hope, by the way, is, is giving us an idea of a, how should we say, a, an assembly. And so hope can be seen if Israel is united as a nation before God. And so God is seen as the hope of Israel, the savior in time of trouble. Now this idea in time of trouble in verse 8. Trouble here is from the word distress. When things are not working out, when things are in, I guess, in, in a way where they are pressed together. So you can see the word op press in, in this sense. Why should you be like a stranger in the land? Like a traveler who turns aside and, well, this word here is to, well, turn aside to stay for a night. We need to break this down a little bit so that we have a better idea of what is being said. He says in verse 8, we are now told, he says, Why should you? So Jeremiah is using this as an example. Why should you be like a stranger, a gar, in the land? And thinking that no God is just coming in and out. So the picture is this. This is Israel. And he's saying God just comes in and then he leaves. Why are you like a stranger in the land? Like a traveler. Now this idea of a traveler means like a wanderer. Someone who is going around, who turns aside to stay for the night. So, is God just coming in and then he parks himself and then when it's time, he goes away? So, the picture here is asking, is, is God no longer interested? Is, is God only, uh, is, is the power of God temporary? These are all very, very much a, a picture type of word to describe why, why, why would God just come and go? Shouldn't God be there all the time? 
why would God leave and let the people uh, be oppressed and be taken over by a foreign nation or be punished in this severe way? Verse 9. So why should you be like a man? Astonished. Well, this word astonished here means surprised or shocked. Why are you shocked? Like a mighty one. And this idea of mighty one is a gibor, like a hero who cannot save. Yet you, O Lord, are in our midst and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. As you can see, this is an appeal. Your name is a very important aspect of God. Israel is called by God's name. Yisrael. And the word El at the back, right here, is God's name. Yisrael. He is, in terms of help, in time of trouble, don't be a stranger. Don't be a man who is shocked. Uh, don't be one who is unable to save. Is, is God's power no longer there? Yet you are in our midst. And this is an appeal to God. By Jeremiah. And the appeal is, do not leave us. Now, this idea of leave literally means do not depart, right? Do not depart from us. Do not abandon us. And this is an appeal by Jeremiah. This is to just bring us to realization that this is how uh, Moses did it. And this is how Daniel did it. And Jeremiah is appealing because God is bent on punishing his people. Verse 10. It says, So thus says the Lord to this people. Who is this people? This people that God wants to punish. And in this case, Judah. So remember, after seeing all this in this chapter, we are looking at the period of Zedekiah. And God is very concerned. God is saying that they love to wander. Right? They love to wander. And they have not restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquities now and punish their sins. These are very strong words. So the complaint is this. They love to wander. The idea here is they are, they are given to, well, the word here is stagger. Like a, like a drunken man, right? Uh, to stagger, uh, to totter. I think he can use this to wander around. So the, the picture that you get is this person is basically going around. So they love to wander. And this picture here, what's wrong with wandering and by, by implication, this means that they are wandering away from God. They have not withheld or keep back, hold in check. Hold back their feet. As their feet want to walk away, they allow their feet to walk away. And then, it says here, therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Well, does not accept them. Uh, well, I guess you can say that this, this would be like saying, it's not 
is not pleased, right? Not pleased with them. Uh, not happy. Not satisfied. Can I also say uh, not acceptable. Now these are all, it, it sounds like you no know, very soft words. Uh, but you need to understand God is not happy with them at all. And as a result, God will remember, bring to mind their avon. Right? The word iniquity is avon. And punish their khatta. And so God is saying, this is important. This is an A and a B. We need to remember that when God says he will remember their iniquity, it means that he will punish their sins. That's what it means here. An A and a B talks about the same thing. We come to verse 11. Then the Lord said to me, and God is telling Jeremiah, do not pray for this people for their good. Now, I want to point out that this has a, a deeper meaning, right? Do not pray for this people. Do not, uh, do not pray for this people for good. Do not ask or intercede on their behalf. This is God's instruction to Jeremiah. And God is saying this, when they fast, I will not hear their cry. Understand what this means. Fasting and crying here would be their prayer. So fasting and prayer goes hand in hand. And when they do that, God says, I will not hear. Then God says, when they offer burnt offering and grain offering as a thanksgiving, I will not accept them. God says, I will, I don't care. Basically, basically that, right? I don't care. I will not be pleased. This is what it means. So I will not accept means I will not be pleased. It is this same idea. Let me just point out to you. This phrase here, not pleased, happy, satisfied, acceptable. And we are back here. Not accept. It is a word play, by the way. It's a word play. But I will consume them by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. The idea here of consume, I think we need to really appreciate, is that God is determined, I will determine to finish them. It is to end it all. It is very strong words. God says, I want to finish this. I want to end it all by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. So there will be a plague. There will be no water. And there will be enemy's sword. And that is what's going to happen to Judah. Verse 13. Then I said, this is now Jeremiah's turn to speak. Then I said, Ah, Adonai, Jehovah. So we are now told in the expression that Jeremiah is saying, Adonai, Jehovah, look, the prophets say to them, and by prophets, we now, as I had described yesterday, these are the false 
prophets. They are saying to them, You shall not see the sword. You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you peace in this place. Now this word here, we have to be mindful of. This is true shalom. These are words that is opposite to God. As you can see, in the previous verse, God says, I will visit you with the sword, with the famine, and with pestilence. Here, the false prophets will say, no, there will be no sword, no famine, and there will be definitely trustworthy, true peace in this place. But as you can see, verse 12 and verse 13 are just going against each other. So who is correct? And the Lord said to me, He says, The prophets prophesy lies. Sheker in my name. I have not sent them. I have not commanded them nor spoken to them. So first thing you need to realize that these are the false prophets. Now, how do you know one is a false prophet? Because they tell lies. They are deceiving in my name. I have not sent them. I have not commanded them nor spoken to them. And then we are told that they prophesy to you a false vision. Then it says, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Basically, everything that the false prophet says is useless. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, whom I did not send, and who say, sword and famine should not be in this land. Now God is saying they are the first to be dealt with. By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. They will die first. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out into the streets of Jerusalem, because of the famine and the sword. So now you can see that God is saying the prophets will suffer first. And then those, the people whom they prophesy, which is number two, and they listen to them, then they will also die. They will have no one to bury them, which is going to be very shameful. Nor their wives, their sons, nor their daughters. Why? Because I will pour their wickedness on them. So I will pour out their evil. This idea of wickedness in verse 16 is really evil. So what God is saying is this. They do evil. Then God will pour evil on them. And this is fair. This is equitable. An eye for an eye, if you want to look at it that way. Therefore, you, Jeremiah, shall say this word to them, Judah. God is saying, let my eyes flow with tears day and night and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people has been broken with a mighty stroke, with a severe blow. The imagery is given that Judah has not been well I guess um, manhandled by a foreign nation and so God says now you will. And when that happens, you are no longer the virgin daughter of my people. The whole idea here is 
the foreign nation of Babylon will come and it will be broken with a mighty stroke with a very severe blow. If I go out to the field, then behold, those slain with the sword. So they have nowhere to run. My people will die in the field. If I enter the city, then behold, those sick from famine, they will die as well. Yes, both prophet and priest go about in a land they do not know. So this word, they do not know. They do not know no i guess you can say they they do not know in verse 18 the word of god they cannot tell the lies and so basically god is saying when they don't follow god's word things are going to go all over the place they will say the wrong things. They will say deceptive things. They are going to be false prophets. And as they follow the lies, they will die. And God says they have no idea what God is saying. And so God says, don't plead for them. In our last segment, it says here, this is a exchange is an exchange with God by Jeremiah and Jeremiah asked have you have you utterly rejected Judah now this idea of utterly reject means to refuse to definitely refuse uh, to Cast off, I guess you can use the word, cast away, definitely. Are you really casting away these people? This is important because in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 44, and you need to go back and read this. And this is to say that God will not cast them away. God will bring them back. But at this point in time, Jeremiah is quoting that verse, probably in the background, asking God, are you really casting away Judah? Has your soul loathed Zion? Loath means abhor. Abhor is to reject. Have your soul rejected Zion? Remember, this will be an A and a B. It says, why have you stricken us so that there is no healing for us? The idea here of healing is a restoration, right? No restoration. Have you struck us or smitten us so that we cannot be restored? Then it says here, we look for shalom, but there was no tome. Right? We look for shalom, but there was no tome. It was not pleasing. And for the time of healing, and there was trouble. So you look at this. This would be another A and a B. They look for the time of restoration, which is shalom. And there was trouble. There was terror. There was dismay. So basically, Jeremiah is saying, everywhere they look, it is hopeless. What happened? The hope of Israel. God is firm to destroy Judah. God is firm that in that destruction, then the city will go and so will the temple. And so it says, Jeremiah is appealing to God as well. 
says, we acknowledge, we know, O Jehovah, our uh, wickedness, Avon, and the iniquity, the khatat of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. We have the guilt, we have the sin, and we have the miss. So this word here is the guilt. We have the resha, that will be guilt. We have the avon, the perverseness of the law. And we have missed the, the sin against you. And this is an acknowledgement. We know. Do not abhor us. The word abhor here means uh, do not spurn us. Do not despise us. Right? Do not despise us. Do not spurn us. Do not shake us away. For your name's sake. So notice all the time, this chapter alone, Israel is real, is Yisrael, by the way, and the name of God is there. And so it says, don't despise us for your name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. That would be another A and a B. That Israel reflects God. It says, remember, do not break your covenant with us. Now verse 21 says, do not Treat, right? Treat lightly. Do not step on it. And so the word break here is very important because it is to step into it and break it into pieces. You're buried with us. See, God doesn't break covenants. Only Israel break covenant. Because God will always honor his part. But what it means here is that God can break the covenant when Israel has broken the covenant. And Jeremiah is appealing to God, don't do that because of your namesake and because it will disgrace the throne of your glory. The appeal is this. Are there among the idols and by idols here uh, in verse 22 would be um, I guess it is not really the the word idols right but we'll get back to that are there any idols of the nations that can cause rain or can the heavens give showers? Remember, we began this book, uh, this chapter about drought. About no water, no rain. And so it says, is there any in existence? In existence, and it says, uh, that has breath. I guess you can say, among the vanities. The vanities of the nations can cause rain. It's idols. These are these are their deities where people pray uh, when they are expecting the supernatural. When there's no rain, they appeal to their gods. So are there any among those gods of the nations that can cause rain? The idea here is to bring rain. Can the heavens give showers? Which is another word for rain or heavy showers. When you go back to Leviticus chapter 26, you would find invariably that God is very serious. 
when there is no rain and God stops the rain, it's because they have been disobedient. And so they need to repent, but they don't. And so the drought continues. You, is it not you? So this word, you not he, means, means um, surely it's you. Maybe you can say that. Surely it is you. Or you can say, um, is it not you, O Lord, our God? Because the only one that can cause rain to fall is Jehovah. And Jeremiah closes the appeal or ends the appeal by saying this. He says, therefore, we will wait for you. The idea of wait for you literally means look, look eagerly for you. To wait for you, to hope in you, uh, to collect together in anticipation on you. And then he says this, because you have made all these, all these things. And by these things, we're talking about the rain, the clouds. And this is an acknowledgement of the Creator. They need rain and it needs to be supernatural. They need God to give them the hope. But until and unless they repent, there is no chance for this drought to go away. And God tells Jeremiah, don't, don't do that. Because at this point in time, God has given them enough opportunity to repent and yet they don't. And so Jeremiah continues to plead with God and entreat God to wait on God. But most importantly, Israel must repent. And so as we continue in chapter 14, we will always see when God wants to punish, he tells them these things that he is very serious, but in hope to seek for a repentance among the nation. But he is not seeing that happening. And with this, we come to the end of chapter 14.